The three biblical texts for the second Sunday of Epiphany, which are 1 Samuel chapter 3 verse 1 to 10, Revelation chapter 5 1 to 10, and John chapter 1 43 to the end, form an interesting combination. At face value, one might be forgiven for thinking that the first is essentially about Samuel having a dream. The second, from the book of Revelation, is about the contents of John's dream. And the third, again at face value, is not about a dream but a story of Jesus calling his disciples together. Though you might say that being asked today to leave your family, your possessions, your occupation, your income, and to follow an unknown itinerant to goodness knows where, and for an unknown purpose, is more than likely to receive the response, in your dreams. And that is probably the polite version. So why have these three texts been placed together, and what is it that they are really telling us? Well, let us consider the story of Samuel first. In today's text, we join Samuel as a boy when he was in the care of Eli, a priest in the temple at Shiloh, an ancient city in Samaria. Samuel was trying to sleep, but each time he lies down, he hears his name being called, Samuel, Samuel, and mistakenly thinking that it is the elderly and almost blind priest, Eli, who is calling him, he gets up to attend him. Three times this happens, before it dawns on the aged Eli that Samuel is possibly being called to by God. An unusual occurrence, even for those days, as we are informed at the start of Samuel chapter 3. And Eli thus tells Samuel how to respond. Samuel takes notice, and when he next hears his name called, he responds thus, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Let us pause there with Samuel, holding those words in our mind for the moment, and move to the reading from Revelation. In its entirety, the book of Revelation is a somewhat strange story about a dream, as experienced by the Apostle John. The dream is essentially a series of visions, usually interpreted as visions of the end times, the eschaton or the apocalypse, wherein John foresees the fall of Satan and the return of Christ. Today's text from Revelation warrants a sermon in its own right, for it is packed with richness. However, for our immediate needs, I am going to simply summarise it. Essentially, John sees God with a scroll in his hand, a scroll sealed with seven seals. Now, in Roman times, it was traditional to seal a person's will or other important documents with the wax seals of seven witnesses. The idea being that the document could not be opened again unless all seven witnesses were present or people authorised to act on their behalf. So, this scroll can be interpreted as God's will, his final settlement of the matters of the universe, but not in the sense of everything being set in stone, an inescapable, foregone conclusion, but more in the sense of it containing God's future plan for the world and the universe. John then hears an angel speaking in a loud voice, challenging anyone who is capable and worthy of the undertaking to come forward and open the scroll. Why a loud voice? Because the angel wants everyone to hear the challenge. But this causes John to weep, for in his dream nobody steps forward. How can God deliver a message to humankind if nobody is able and willing to receive it? Nobody, that is, until Jesus appears on the scene. Jesus depicted in the dream as a lamb. Jesus is able to loosen the seals and read the scroll. He can do this because of his obedience to God. Such obedience allows him to know God's will, to understand God's secrets, and be given the duty to control what is happened next. Because of Jesus, 
Everyone in the dream starts singing, singing a new song. And of course, this sense of newness is a theme in Revelation. It is the book of new things, a new name, a new Jerusalem, a new song, new heavens, a new earth, and the promise of God making all things new. The point is that Jesus brings a new quality to life, a new peace, a new strength, a new joy, many of the elements of Christian life. And in that song, John is told that in the subsequent death of Jesus, we, as children of God, are made royal. Remember that Jesus was of the royal house of David, and that we are made priests, all of us. We are all given the right of access to God and to serve as priests. Which brings us to the Gospel reading for today. We join the story of Jesus in Galilee, where Jesus, having already collected Andrew, who in turn brought Peter, summons Philip with the words, Follow me. Philip, in turn, finds Nathanael, whom some scholars believe may be one and the same as Bartholomew. Nathanael is sceptical, uttering that well-known line, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now, I'm not going to draw local comparisons, but I'm sure you will all have a village, or city, or town, of your own in mind, from where you might consider it unlikely that someone politically powerful would originate. Think of that village, town, or city, and you'll get the sense of Nathaniel's incredulity. Anyway, Jesus is up for the challenge. He intuitively recognises Nathaniel as a just, honest, and upright person, and recognises his dreams and desires, and says as much, which both flatters and amazes Nathaniel, and there and then convinces him to believe in Jesus and to follow him. Amused at Nathaniel's amazement at his insight, and his readiness to change his mind about Nazareth and to believe in him, Jesus essentially says, if you think that is clever, you ain't seen nothing yet and draws an analogy with himself and Jacob's ladder, that symbolic connection between earth and heaven, as found in Genesis chapters 25 to 28. Saying that, soon Nathanael will see the Son of Man, meaning Jesus, connecting heaven and earth, with angels ascending and descending on Jesus rather than on a ladder. This also being an illusion to Jesus later saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, etc. Now, for me, there are many questions stemming from this whole story about Jesus. For example, what did Jesus actually say to the disciples that was so persuasive, that they just upped and followed him? What were they thinking when they did so? What did they expect he was going to do? We will never know for sure, but one thing is certain. Whatever they thought was going to happen at that moment in time, personal persuasion and recommendation between the disciples played a large part in bringing new disciples into the group, the spreading of the word between themselves. Now, let us leave the text there for a moment and return to the concept of dreams. The famous psychiatrist, Carl Jung, understood dreams to be the bridge between the conscious and the unconscious mind. He wrote, We are so captivated by and entangled in our subjective consciousness that we have forgotten the age-old fact that God speaks chiefly through dreams and visions. The Christian puts his church and his Bible between himself and his unconscious. So, with Young's words in mind, let me give you some questions to ask of yourselves. When was the last time you had a dream? When did you last take a dream seriously? Would you expect God to speak to you in a dream? And if so, when did you last realise that God spoke to you in a dream? 
And in more general terms, are we, as Christians, willing to leave our old lives behind, just as the first disciples did, and unquestionably follow Jesus? Are we willing to receive God's message on behalf of today's generations and call others to hear the message of Jesus so that they too might follow? Do we consider ourselves worthy enough to remove the seals on the scroll containing God's will? Are we ready to be witnesses to God's plan, to act as members of the royal house of David, to be God's priestly people? Are we willing to step forward, unlock the secrets of God's plan for the future of the world, and to take action accordingly, to sing a new song and usher in the new Jerusalem and fulfil our destiny as Christians in God's name? If the answers to those questions is no, then we must question what it is that we do believe. However, if the answer to at least some of those questions is yes, then perhaps we need to start taking greater note of our dreams, to listen to the messages contained within them, to be more receptive to God's message, and to be willing to recognise that God may already be speaking to each of us as individuals from deep within our subconscious minds, calling each of us to unquestionably follow him. Are we ready to accept that may be possible? If so, perhaps a good place to start is for each of us to say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening.